I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you very much, Chucky, for your uh, generous welcome. And uh, thanks to you for coming along to tonight's talk. Uh, when Dougie talked about um, the, uh, the, the ticket sales for this season's, uh, this season's operas, which we all rejoice in, of course, I thought it was no surprise that, uh, that he didn't say there were tickets available for Figaro. <laughs> because, as I'm sure you all feel, uh, Le Nozze di Figaro is, is often seen, certainly for opera lovers, as Mozart's most perfect work, epitomizing the dramatic and musical genius of the young composer. But it's also the ideal work with which to demonstrate how the genius operated in the 18th century opera house, not as an isolated phenomenon working alone, but rather as a skillful articulator of networks. Figaro is ideal to demonstrate this because it shows that those operatic networks spread right across Europe. Indeed, the opera depended on that sense of European interconnectedness as a driver for its success. Thus, as I imagine you all know, um, uh, Da Ponte and Mozart's Figaro was derived from Beaumarchais, uh, Caron de Beaumarchais' Parisian sm smash hit, Le Mariage de Figaro. And indeed, they chose it precisely because the series of Beaumarchais plays had been so successful in Paris and had then spread throughout Europe in written form. And they chose this, the second of the plays in Beaumarchais' trilogy, because Giovanni Paisiello's setting of the first Beaumarchais play, Le Barbier de Seville, had already proved a runaway success in Vienna in 1783, uh, when it had premiered there. It had actually um, premiered the year before in, in 1782 in St. Petersburg, uh, where it was also hugely successful. Um, uh, in many ways, Paisiello's most successful opera. Um, so they followed hot on the heels, as you can see, in uh, adapting um, Beaumarchais' second work. And what's particularly interesting, perhaps, about this table is that you can see, whereas there are seven years, there were seven years between the first of Beaumarchais' trilogy and Paisiello's adaptation, um, <clears throat> there were only two between Beaumarchais' second play and Da Ponte and Mozart's uh, adaptation for the operatic stage. Um, they knew that they were on to a winner. They knew that they were on to something that everyone wanted to hear. Uh, so Paisiello's opera had been extraordinarily successful. Indeed, it remained in the repertory for many years, achieving around 100 performances by the turn of the, the century, which was no mean feat in those days. Um, and it continued to be so successful that when Rossini brought out his own Barber of Seville, it's the same story, um, when he brought out his version of the Barber of Seville, it was initially rejected by audiences, furious that this young upstart composer would be so presumptuous as to challenge the genius of Paisiello. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Rossini became more successful and the Paisiello dropped back in terms, of, uh, in terms of popularity, but to have lasted from uh, the, as it did from, from the 1780s to the 1820s was quite an extraordinary feat for opera in those days. Um, it's interesting to note that Mozart's opera only achieved 20 performances in Vienna up to 1790. In fact, it had eight in its initial run versus um, Paisiello, who achieved 60 performances uh, in that same period, uh, or rather from 1784 to, to 1790. What this suggests is not so much that Paisiello's music was better, although actually it was good. I mean, people will say to you, Paisiello, blah, but no, it, it's, it's, really in, it's really an interesting opera, and I'd love to have time to talk about Paisiello's Barber, but and for another day. <clears throat> Um, so, but it wasn't about the fact that Paisiello's music was better. It was more that Mozart was a little-known figure at that stage, working in a world dominated by fashionable Italians. In this, Mozart was somewhat unlucky with his timing. In 1781, when he moved to Vienna, having left Salzburg and the employ of Archbishop Colloredo, 
Emperor Joseph II was five years into an experiment with German language national theatre. So he'd sent, in 1776, he dismissed the Italian opera company, he'd sent them packing in order to give a German company a free run. And it was for this company, in fact, that Mozart wrote Die Entführung aus dem Serai in 1782. Mozart's Singspiel had, by his account, gone down very well. Here's what he wrote <coughs> to his father on the 21st of December in 1782. And, of course, we all bear in mind when we're reading Mozart's letters to his father that there are sons' letters to his father, and he's anxious to show that he's doing well. On the 10th, my opera was performed again with the greatest applause. It was the 14th time, and the theatre was as full as on the first night, or rather, it was as packed as it had invariably been. Count Rosenberg himself spoke to me at Prince Galitzin's and suggested that I should write an Italian opera. I've already commissioned someone to procure for me from Italy the latest opera buffe text to choose from. Some Italian male and female singers are coming here at Easter. Now, as we can see from this comment, having just made his mark in German Zingspiel, Mozart now found that the tide was again turning. Joseph had apparently given up on his German language experiment and was re-establishing an Italian opera company for which, according to one of the singers, the Irishman Michael Kelly, quote, no expense was to be spared. So in other words, they were recruiting the best singers possible from Italy, which was the place to get them. Although Mozart claimed to maintain an affinity with the German company, he quickly realised the value of switching to Italian opera buffa if he could get his foot in the door. I say that because the reopening of the Italian company at the Burg Theater in 1783 also seems to have meant that Vienna returned to the domination of Italian composers, librettists, and performers. Um, this table showing, uh, showing the number of performances for all the composers at the Burg Theater in Vienna between 1783 and 1790, so in other words, uh, that, that period that I was just talking about, demonstrates just how dominant the, Italian, the Italians were. So of the top five, in terms of number of, of performances, only uh, Vicente Martini Soler was not Italian. He's Spanish, but he spent so much of his time in Italy and working in the Italian idiom that he was effectively a naturalised Italian anyway. And you can see Mozart languishing down here at number eight, next to his good friend Stephen Storis, or Storace, who was a, an Italian Englishman. Um, so, uh, where am I? So Mozart really is kind of trailing well behind there. And of course, I mean, there are other, uh, there are other Italians further um, down the list, P Piccicchio, um, who we'll come back to in a minute, Rigini, but most of these other names, Seidelmann, Weigel, um, Dittersdorf, uh, Rust, um, they, were, uh, they were Germans. So what this indicates is chiefly the Viennese liking for foreign products on the one hand, and the running of Italian opera companies as a bit of a closed shop on the other. This, by the way, was not uncommon outside Italy. Would-be opera composers, singers and librettists in London at the time complained vigorously that the cabal of Italians around the opera were very reluctant to allow anyone else in. And this also went for native British or, Vien or indeed native Viennese audience members who wanted to show their sophistication by supporting imported products rather than the homegrown variety. Uh, which is not to say, of course, that Mozart didn't get support as he went through his career, but in terms of popularity in the opera house, this was a significant factor. Uh, and, and indeed, this is part of the reason why Stephen Storis and his sister Nancy, who created the original Susanna in, in Figaro, were sent off from England to Italy to study. 
so that they might, when they returned to England, be treated as the equivalents of, of Italians. Um, sadly for Stephen, it didn't particularly work, and he spent all his time writing comic opera in the, uh, the sort of lower English theatres rather than working in the main Italian opera house, again because of this cabal. So anyway, all this partly explains why da Ponte and Mozart chose Figaro for their first collaboration. They were working on well-established ground in 1785 to 86 and could be pretty sure that almost all their audience would have either read Beaumarchais's play or seen Paisiello's opera, or more probably both. Paisiello's opera had its 38th performance at the Bourg Theater just three months before Mozart's opera premiered, and all this in turn would have helped to ensure a reasonable reception for the young composer in as much as he was working with a story that everyone, everyone already knew. And something I should just uh, um, uh, say here is that uh, although I'm sure you hardened Garsington opera goers go to more than one performance of the same work in a season, I doubt you go to all of them, which is what they did in the 18th century. You had a season subscription, you had your box if you could uh, afford it, and you would go for the whole season. That would be your, uh, your entertainment, unless some friend came and asked you if they could borrow the, your box for the evening, and you'd loan it out and go and play cards or something somewhere else. Um, and uh, I'll show you a slide that illustrates this in a, mo in a moment. <clears throat> According to Da Ponte, it was Mozart who suggested the choice of story, and they knew they had to work fast if they were to get it on stage before other settings of the opera came out. But given that they were choosing a controversial story, they were also beset with difficulties. Um, Talking with Mozart on this matter one day, said Paisiello, he asked me if I could easily arrange an opera, as an opera, the comedy by Beaumarchais entitled The Nozze di Figaro. The idea pleased me well, and I promised him to do it. But there was a very great difficulty to overcome. A few days earlier, the emperor had forbidden the German theatre company to perform this comedy, which was written, he said, with too much license for a well-mannered audience. <laughs> so how could one offer it to him as an opera? And by license, uh, he meant probably not simply uh, issues of morality, although there were those, but rather more of um, political insubordination. Um, so da Ponte apparently came up with the answer and says that he told the emperor that having written a drama per musica, that is to say an opera, and not a comedy, I have had to omit many scenes and shorten numerous others, and I have omitted and shortened anything that could offend the sensibility and decency of a spectacle at which his majesty presides. Famously, that is to say, da Ponte cut much of the politics, and particularly Figaro's extended rant against the aristocracy in Act 5 of Beaumarchais' play, which had made uh, Beaumarchais' proto-revolutionary reputation. Uh, if we think about the timing of this, it all becomes, the politics become particularly febrile, as you can imagine. Now, there were also practical reasons for da Ponte's cuts. He explained in the preface to the libretto, the duration prescribed as being usual for dramatic performances, a certain number of characters generally introduced into the same, and some other prudent considerations and exigencies imposed by morality, place, and spectators, were the reasons why I did not make a translation of this excellent comedy, but rather an adaptation, or let us say an extract. To this end, I was obliged to reduce the 16 characters of which it consists to... I think I've written element. I think that's an autocorrect. That's meant to be 11. <laughs> so, and to, and to admit, admit, apart from an entire act, many a very charming scene and a number of good jests and sallies with which it's strewn, in place of which I had to substitute canzonettas, arias, choruses, and other forms and words susceptible to music. Now, actually, da Ponte cut hardly any of Beaumarchais' scenes. And, uh, you know, we don't, we, we won't go through this in detail, but you can see that there's da Ponte's column there, there's Beaumarchais' column there, and the little X's represent scenes that are in one and aren't in the other. And you can see that there are really rather few X's 
in Da Ponte's, uh, in da Ponte's column. And of course, he added a few things. So there are a few things uh, that are included in Da Ponte that aren't in, in Beaumarchais. But he was really remarkably faithful. Um, so uh, he nonetheless did have to cut the play considerably for musical production because, of course, it takes longer to sing something than it does to say it. He also had to create appropriate lyric texts for musical numbers. Of the three arias you'll hear this evening for Figaro, Non più andrai farfalone amoroso, sung mockingly to the young Cherubino in Act One, in the rhythm of a march and with military trumpet-style melodic figures, is taken almost word for word from Beaumarchais. But the other two, Se vuol parlare and Aprito e un po' quegli occhi, were largely invented by da Ponte, made to suit likely musical forms that Mozart would want to use. It's interesting to note that even though da Ponte took Beaumarchais's text for Non più andrai, Mozart then fiddled around with it, repeating and rearranging parts of the text to turn it into an extended rondo, perhaps um, because it came at the end of the first act and he wanted to give, it, uh, give, the, give the act more weight uh, to, in order to sort of bring it to a close. So um, if I put the text up, perhaps John and Andrew would be so good as to perform it for us.
terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so you can hear the, the kind of energy and vitality that that gives to the end of the end of the act. Sends people out on a with with a buzz. Um, and. You can also see, and I hoped you could hear, the, the restructuring that Mozart did to uh, De Ponte's text. So Mozart was always very actively involved in um, the construction of the texts. Uh, when Da Ponte was writing, it wasn't only musical forms and his engagement with Mozart that he had to take into account, it was also operatic convention, and in particular, the needs of the singers and the audience. The famous librettist, Carlo Gordoni, wrote satirically on this topic in the 1760s, supposedly describing an encounter with a paternal advisor early in his career who emphasized the needs of the singers. And, and so this advisor is saying to Goldoni, uh, you've sent me this libretto, but everything's all wrong in it. Let me explain to you what's wrong. Uh, the first soprano. Uh, castrato, this, um, in the 18th century, if, if they use the term soprano, it always meant castrato. The first soprano, the prima donna, and the tenor, who are the three principal actors in the drama, must sing five arias each, a pathetic, a bravura, a pallante, a mezzo carattere, and a brillante. The second man and the second woman must have four each, and the last character, three, likewise a seventh character if there is one, Parenthetically, there must be no more than six or seven characters, and you, Goldoni, have nine in your drama. The second singers aspire to have pathetic arias too, but the lead singers won't permit it. <laughs> and if the scene is pathetic, the aria can't be more that if the scene is pathetic for the second singers, in other words, the aria can't be more than mezzo carattere, a uh, kind of moderato mid character. The 15 arias of the lead singers must be distributed in such a way that two of the same kind don't succeed one another, and the arias of the other actors help create a chiaroscuro. In other words, uh, you must always have contrast of mood. You can't have a succession of arias in the same mood. Um, uh, this, this sounds like a joke, and as Goldoni puts it across, it is, but actually this is very much how librettists had to think. They had to think about this balance, about this chiaroscuro. They also had to think about um, the beginnings of acts and ends of acts, that the best singers would always have the prima donna and the primo uomo, the first man, the castrato, would always have to have uh, at the opening or closing arias of the act. So the dramatic structure would have to work in a way that would give them those places easily. It wasn't an easy task. And we know from contemporaneous accounts like Da Ponte's of the first rehearsal of another opera that came just a few months after Figaro in 1786 that singers could ruin an opera if they didn't like it. <laughs> da Ponte said of Martini Soler's Una Cosa Rara, which is a wonderful opera and was recognized as such, he said that scarcely were the parts distributed than all hell seemed to break loose. <laughs> One singer had too many recitatives, another not enough. For one, the aria was too low, for another too high. Some did not enter into the ensembles, others had to sing in too many. The fire spread everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, and, and this would mean a good deal of rewriting for Martini Soler. But we should beware our modern tendency to sort of take the composer's part about the uppertiness of singers usurping the musical privilege. In the 18th century, no one bought their clothes ready-made, and neither was music expected to come off the peg. The smart librettist and the smart composer, knowing in any case how little rehearsal time they had with their singers and how many operas those singers were getting through in a season, would tailor their plot and their music to suit the capabilities and talents of the performers, to ensure that their opera would be shown in the best light by grateful but rushed singers. Mozart and da Ponte certainly knew who their singers were, their abilities and their limitations, and they worked with those singers in mind. In particular, Mozart took great care to exploit the talents of Francesco Benucci, who led the company, he was a basso buffo, he led the company and he took the role of Figaro. 
As much to the point for Da Ponte and Mozart when it came to tailoring their opera, they knew that their audience knew their singers, just as they knew Beaumarchais's play already and knew Paisiello's setting of Il Barbiere di Siviglia. In fact, audiences might well have brought their sources with them. Rather, as this picture shows, they were perfectly accustomed to reading their libretti or other things, if they were bored, in the opera. And I, I mean, I'm sorry that the picture's a bit faint. You might want to come and have a look at it afterwards. But you can perhaps see um, there's the Primo Uomo declaiming away. There, even on stage, the, the extras are having a chat amongst themselves. <laughs> you can see down here, however, that you've got a soldier here with his, with his um, uh, bayonet fixed in case of riots. Um, but you've got here someone hawking drinks, selling drinks. You can't quite see, but just off to the side here is someone else selling oranges and someone in the front row buying an orange from her. And you can see that various other people are not facing the front. <laughs> uh, and you can per perhaps can't quite make out, but one or two of them who are being attentive, presumably, are being attentive with their libretto in their hands. Bearing in mind that in the 18th century, you couldn't dim the lighting. So when audiences came in with the beautiful candelabra over their head, they stayed with the candelabra over their head. If they could read when they arrived, they could read all the way through the production and talk and eat and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> what this meant for Da Ponte and Mozart was that they could rely on their audiences to make connections with other works, both Beaumarchais and Paisiello's, um, that would enrich the enjoyment of the opera and allow Da Ponte and Mozart to take some shortcuts in terms of dramatic construction and musical construction because their viewers, their, their audience members, would fill in the gaps. Uh, and turning it around, it meant that Da Ponte and Mozart actively created interconnections with other works, enjoying the opportunity to show off their knowledge to the audience and in the process to allow the audience members to feel clever for getting in on the joke. Nor were they the only ones to do this. In fact, they participated, as I said right at the beginning, in a densely interrelated network which connected singers, roles, role types, and music. So I would now like to talk uh, um, about a couple of music examples from Figaro, uh, Figaro's arias and hear John sing a couple more of them by way of illustration of this idea of interconnectedness. Figaro is first introduced to us, as we, as we all know, I'm sure, measuring up the room that he and Susanna will inhabit on their marriage. The 18th century audience would have instantly recognized him as the basso buffo, not only because they knew the singer, Benucci, but also because it's music with his, the, its short phrases, its alternating wide leaps with faster, patter-like speech, announced him as part of a venerable tradition. And I'm going to illustrate that tradition for you now with um, a series of clips of um, other works from through the 18th century and into the 19th century that show this grumbling basso buffo in, at the opening of the opera. And I hope you will hear, be able to hear the, um, the musical similarities. So if this works. This is um, Pergolesi's La Serva Padrona. Sorry, the streaming's not right. And, and so on. And so if you're finding the streaming of the video bothersome, just shut your eyes and listen to the music. Um, Paisiello also set La Serva Padrona. It was a very famous text. Um, 
in 1781. So let's hear a little bit of the same aria, um, uh, the same aria text in Paisiello's setting. And again, you'll hear those leaps, the grumbling sort of short phrases. Uh, and let's see. I'm sorry about the orchestra. Another one with which you're very familiar, but if you listen to it in the context of the um, Pergolesi and the Paisiello, maybe you'll hear it a bit differently. Rossini's uh, Cenerentola from the early 19th century. And so on. So, hearing all of those with their wide leaps, their grumbling figures, we maybe hear the opening of Figaro in that context. Stop that there. So, um, <clears throat> Susanna's arrival and revelation to Figaro of the Count's plot to seduce her throws him into turmoil. Um, and their duet, incidentally, this duet also demonstrates that she is the one who wears the trousers as she takes musical control of, uh, of, of and dramatic control of, of what's going on in, in the duet. Um, once left alone again, however, Figaro, in turn, demonstrates his dem determination to outwit the Count in his first aria, Se vuol ballare. This aria is in a kind of rounded binary form that also has within it the basic da capo aria. Now, the da capo aria by this time was so old-fashioned that no one included them in serious opera, in opera seria, any longer. But the da capo aria, A, B, A, was still sung by serious characters in opera buffa as a way of signalling their very traditional behaviour and their difference. So Figaro is appropriating a serious form 
to sing about his aim to get the better of his social superior, the Count. But it's not just the form that he appropriates, it's also the style, because Mozart sets the opening to this aria as a minuet, which was the archetypal aristocratic dance. One can imagine that da Ponte and Mozart might even have discussed this, as Leopold Mozart suggested in his comment on, um, when he was describing his son's particularity over libretti. He said, there will be a lot of running about and discussions before he gets the libretto so adjusted as to suit his purposes exactly. So um, Leopold knew, knew his son well, um, and it does seem likely that they discussed this aria because Figaro's words seem to invite the use of a dance topic. Se vuol ballare, signor Contino, il chitarino, io suonerò. If you want to dance, little signor Count, I will call the tune, or actually literally, I will play the chitarone, I will play the guitar for you, because it's set in Spain, so the chitarone is appropriate. Uh, and he goes on... <clears throat> Se vuol venire nella mia scuola, la capriola le signerò. L'insegnerò, sorry. Um, so, if you, want to, uh, if you want to learn how to dance, come to my school, and I will teach you the capriole, which was a jumping dance. So, literally, I will teach you how to jump, he says. Um, and this is something... The, the, the use of the minuet to convey this dance music was something absolutely everyone in the audience would have recognised. The minuet was a ubiquitous dance, everyone did it. The other thing they might have recognised is a reference to Figaro's first aria in Paisiello's Barber of Seville, where he's talking about his various talents to win a job with Count. Um, and, and he uses, uh, Mozart quotes this in Se vuol ballare, and so now he's effectively demonstrating another talent as a dancing master, but rather than doing it to win a position with the Count, he's doing it to get better of the Count. Let's hear Se vuol ballare. Oh, 
so this is a terrific little aria, and it must also have made an impression on the audience and on the singer, the great Benucci himself, because interestingly, just three months after the premiere of Mozart's Figaro in 1786, uh, Giuseppe Sarti's um, I Fintieridi was staged at the Burg Theater, and it quoted this aria. So uh, there is the uh, quotation. Now, like Figaro, the opera is centered on a lower class couple, country dwellers, Pierotto and Janina, whose relationship is tested by the arrival of a nobleman who sets his sights on Janina. The parallel was made pointed because Pierotto and Janina were sung by Benucci and Nancy Storis, the pair who had also created Figaro and Susanna. To make this parallel still clearer, at the moment when Pierotto realizes the Count is attempting to seduce Janina, he sings the aria Or comprendo un po' più schietto. Now I understand a little more clearly. The middle section of which seems to explicitly quote the third and fourth lines of Save World Ballare. John, could you, would you oblige? <laughs> Abbiate giudizio, signor Marchesino. Signor Marchesino. Thank you very much. So, so you can. <laughs> so, so you can hear the the similarity that that would have been uh, noticeable also to the audience. Just to be clear, this aria, which was added f just for Benucci in the Viennese version of I Finti Eredi, is not a sign of poor imagination or plagiarism. It indicates an expectation on the part of the opera's creators that the audience would want and would understand a sophisticated network of cross-references and in-jokes that would make their opera-going experience a more lively participatory one. Mozart himself participated in this practice very willingly. I mentioned earlier that he would have expected the audience to know Paisiello's Barber, and so he created clear references. For example, um, the Countess's Porgi Amor in Act Three of Figaro is a homage to Rosino's Giusto Cell in Paisiello's Barber of Seville, um, using the same key and meter and tempo and orchestration and so on. He was happy to create cre connections to other works too, Don Bartolo's La Vendetta clearly recalls Paisiello's Io Re Sonno from Il Re Teodato of, uh, sorry, Teodoro of 1784. And again, both roles were sung by Bonucci. We're just going to hear a tiny bit of both, and you'll hear the comparison. <laughs> And now we'll go on to Paisiello. So you get the point. As I say, Mozart would have expected his listeners, his, his audience, to have spotted those. It's also one good way to keep people awake and to keep people attentive. Um, so, uh, and Figaro's Non Piu Andrai, which we heard earlier, must have been popular because Mozart quoted it in Don Giovanni uh, when it was played by the stage band within the ballroom medley. Benucci played Leporello in this opera, and when he hears the music as Leporello, he turns to the audience and says, Questa poi la conosco, purtroppo. Now that tune, I know all too well, he says. <laughs> Given the audience's level of involvement in the drama, it's not surprising that there was not just the odd aside, but whole arias effectively addressed to the audience. Aprito e un po' quegli occhi is one such aria directed to the men in the audience, exhorting them to open their eyes to the dangers of womankind, <coughs> reflecting Figaro's own disillusionment with, whoops, sorry, with the apparently deceptive Susanna. This, you will recall, is all that was left of the long political speech Beaumarchais originally wrote, which Darponte cut. The complaint against women, of course, was just as political in a social sense as anything challenging the aristocracy, but because it affirmed the status quo rather than challenging it, it was readily retained. 
Nonetheless, the beauty and the seriousness of the music Mozart and others wrote for their comic characters did present a challenge to the status quo, as late 18th century critics <coughs> knew and often lamented. Here is uh, Koch. Ever since they began to dress up buffoon ariettes in the form of broad-scale arias, the serious arias have necessarily declined more and more in value, for as soon as the humorous masters the form of the serious, the serious takes on the features of the humorous. And Count Carlo Gozzi, complaining about Goldoni, who was a very influential librettist, by making noble people stupid, ridiculous, and untrustworthy, while exalting the heroic actions of plebeians, Goldoni sets a bad example, one contrary to the indispensable rule of subordination. <laughs> you can see then why uh, there were concerns about Beaumarchais' play and why da Ponte took pains to make the cuts that he did. Uh, but as I say, we have the glory of Mozart's music that retains so much of, uh, uh, and indeed adds to, the, the dramatic intent of the original play. And without further ado, let's close with... With that. Tutto è disposto, ora dovrebbe essere vicina. Io sento gente, ed essa non è alcuna. Oh, uh -huh.